Hey, hello. Sam Romeo here again today, environmental educator at Allwood. Today we are going to be talking trees. There are some facts I'll talk about, uh, some tree identification, and I'll also be providing a good link uh, to help you identify trees because all these trees are starting to leaf out now. As you can see, everything is nice and green behind me. So let's go check out some of the trees that we have around Allwood. So there are a couple other ways than just looking at the leaf or the bark to help you identify some trees. Um, you can also look at the twigs and how the leaves are growing. Okay, so one saying that many people might know is called mad buck. And what this means is maple, ash, dogwood, and buckeye. And those trees are opposite leafed. Okay, so here we have a maple. And you can see right where these ticks come off, they're right across from each other. Okay, and this is a maple. Now here we have a hackberry leaf. And these are alternating. So the leaf is actually not across from each other. They're kind of staggered, one off the other. So that is alternate. So we do have different variations from uh, just opposite and alternating leaves. We also have something that is called simple or compound leaf. Um, so one thing is here is a compound leaf. This is a buckeye leaf, okay? And this is actually called palmate leaf compound. So you can see all the leaves come from one central point, okay? So on the leaf bud, as the tree's growing out, all the leaves come from one single spot. So this is a compound leaf. Another compound leaf we have comes from this tree right here. And this is a walnut tree, okay? So as you can see, here is the whole stem of the tree. All right, so this all grew out of the tree just like that. And then these, are on that one single leaf. So that is considered one leaf. Now as compared to something else like this birch tree, okay, this is just a simple leaf, okay? So, oh, don't mind me. So this just single leaf came out, so that is a simple leaf, okay? So we have compound, and then we have simple leaf. And then we have different variations like the palmate leaf compound, like buckeyes, okay? Um, so take these into consideration when looking at your trees. If you have a tree in your backyard or they find out in the trail and you just really can't identify, these are some of kind of the advanced ways to identify. So here we have a tree that is actually in the maple family. This is a box elder. Sometimes people see these and think, oh, it's a big poison ivy tree because, you know, it does have three leaves. But this is actually a box elder tree. It likes to grow in wetter soils usually, but it is in the maple family. So here we have some other maple leaves. So we have a lot of different maples in Ohio, but I'm just kind of showing two extremes here. We have a sugar maple and a silver maple. Um, the reason for this is maples fall into two categories. We have the so-called soft maples, which is just like a silver maple here, which is found usually in urban environments. I see it a lot. Um, the other one is a red maple. Um, they both have serrated lobe margins. Um, and then the other maple that we have is the sugar maple, and that's kind of considered a hard maple. Um, you know, it's also our source of maple syrup, which comes from the sap. Um, usually in February, it takes about 40 gallons to make one gallon of syrup. Remember that, 40 gallons to one gallon of maple syrup. So another tree we get very often here at Allwood, I think one of the kind of the most trees I kind of see around here, but this is a hackberry. So here are the leaves, opposite leaf, kind of softer, longer. Uh, we got tooth margins there, but the bark, look at this bark. This bark is one of the ways that I usually identify it most. Uh, this is one that is in its mature stage. And over here, we have it kind of in its younger stage, but when it matures, the uh, bark, it has this very high ridges on it. You can see just how deep it is. Put my finger in about that deep, so. But this is hackberry. Um, a lot of people consider it a very hardy tree. It grows in a lot of different areas, a lot of different soils, all across different parts of the United States. So, once again, hackberry. So this next tree, this tall white branch beauty behind me, is a sycamore tree. So sycamore trees considered the river's edge keeper because they usually grow just along or near water. So Native Americans would use these while they're 
you know, being nomadic, moving around hunting, they can easily find these trees because that white branches really stick out very well in the tree line. So they knew that water was nearby. Um, something else that's really interesting. So you see this behind me, we have a vine crawling up it. Something that's interesting about sycamore trees is their bark on the way up starts to peel off and reveals this white portion underneath it. So what these sycamores do when they're younger actually, and this is a very old sycamore, this is a big one. All right, they will actually shed their bark to prevent vines from climbing up it. And what these vines usually do with grapevines or Virginia creeper, once they get big enough, um, they can eventually pull the tree down uh, because the tree is kind of growing up against it. So being able to shed its vines so they can grow big and tall, um, you know, is one of the really cool adaptations that they have. So here is one of our big trees at Allwood. This is a black walnut tree. Um, so something cool about trees is you see this big, long branch that goes all the way out. We have another one really big here. So within that area of just how big these trees are, the kind of farther outreaching branches, is what we call the crown. So if you could pretty much take, I guess, the waist measurement of this tree around the crown of it up there, um, that gives you a sense of just how big the root system underneath the tree is. So I'm standing probably 20 feet, 25 feet away from this tree right now, and I am almost on the outside crown of it. Within this area is about how big the root system of the tree is, all right? So with black walnuts, they actually cause something that's called alleopathy. Um, and this pretty much translates to neighbor sickening. So the roots of black walnuts and the fruit that it drops actually has a uh, chemical that has a detrimental effect on plants. So you know, you probably have heard that gardeners shouldn't be planting anything uh, underneath black walnut trees because not only the root system, you know, this would be a massive root system, maybe even past the trail, uh, but even the fruits can drop and kind of cause this chemical to leach into the ground. All right, but once again, black walnut, um, the fruits, you know, very well known as being edible and the bark itself, really dark, but just probably one of my favorite trees because it has a lot of use. So here we have a, another cool tree at Allwood. It is not a red bud. It is basswood. So with basswood, it has these teeth on the end of the leaf. So that's a good idea. So something that's cool about basswood, um, it is usually made into a fiber, a very tough fiber. It has a very tough inner bark or a bast for making cords um, or ropes. So pioneers originally called it bast wood, B-A-S-T. It's the only one from the Native Americans, you know, it's very fiber fibrous. Um, but they called it basswood, B-A-S-T, um, at that time. And that's where it gets its common name now, American basswood. All right, just a smaller one. So here we have another one of our big trees of all wood. This is our very big chinquapin oak, okay? So that is in the white oak family. And then we have another one down there, which is a chestnut, you can see it. So I'm just on the paved trail. So there are, just like the maples, two different types of oak trees. So the white oaks are swamp white oak, bur oak, chinquapin, post oak. Um, and then some of the other ones are the red oak family. And those are black oaks, ping oaks, and shingle oaks. All right, so the thing with those is red oak families have pointy leaves on their lobes, okay? Um, and that is the kind of a bristle-tipped lobe, while the white oaks have a more rounded lobe leaf, okay? Now, something else that's interesting about these oaks is they have more galls than any other tree. Now, not G-U-L-L-S as in a seagull or something, uh, but gall as in G-A-L-L. -L. And what this is, it's a peculiar structure that plants produce... Um, in response to a, an attack of some kind, usually insects. It's often found in goldenrod. You've ever seen a big old ball in a goldenrod stem? Um, that is a gall. So it's sometimes broadly defined as, you know, different things, sometimes fungus, but they are very distinctive and they can usually be used to identify an organism that caused it. Um, so these are usually formed by tiny wasps in the immature stages of these oak trees. Um, and once they start growing, they kind of grow this, you know, extra cell growth around them, which makes it nice and hard. But oak trees usually get what almost look like apples, uh, like papery ping pong balls. Um, 
So, you know, those are usually called a woolly oak gall. So that's something to keep out for if you have any oaks in your property. Once again, this is a chiquapin oak. And just like the maples, we have two main families of them. So here we have another commonly used tree for tools and, um, you know, its wood is a very sought after timber. But this is a shagbark hickory. So you can kind of tell this wood is kind of shaggy up the ways. Usually when they get older, they become more shaggier. Um, so something interesting about the hickory trees is they tend to have funny names. I think they have the shellbark hickory, the mocker nut hickory, pig nut hickory, and then this one, of course, aptly named the shagbark hickory. Um, when I was talking about the use for timber is this is a pretty hard wood, but it's mostly used because it can take a lot of shock. So it's typically used for ax handles, hammers, different tools. All right, so it's not the strongest as such a, you know, say an oak or a walnut, but um, it could take that kind of impact. So that's why it's used for tools a lot. So here we have an elm tree. Um, this is an American elm. If you feel the leaves, sometimes they're furry. Um, the only tree of the elm family that isn't furry is the slippery elm, but the leaf structure is about the same. And it is an alternating simple leaf. So something interesting about elms is they used to be a very popular tree to plant in urban settings, um, but then it was de slowly decimated by the Dutch elms disease, which causes them not to become too much bigger than say this hackberry here. Um, so that was pretty much brought on by two vectors, uh, two different types of beetles from two different areas. Now it didn't come from the Netherlands, uh, the disease itself. They think it came from portions of Asia but how it was brought to North America actually has a tie to Ohio in it. So um, there was in the 20s when it was first discovered, um, logs were being shipped from Europe and actually the Netherlands used as veneer for furniture in the Ohio furniture industry. Um, so that's where it usually spread, you know, from Northeast Ohio in the veneer factories. Uh, and then it made it all the way up to Minnesota in the 1970s. Um, so the duck elm disease, you know, it kind of killed a lot of the elm trees that we had and now is stunted a growth of a lot of our other elms that we have throughout our area. So here we have a honey locust tree, which has these gnarly looking spikes on it, these giant thorns. So these giant thorns were originally thought to protect this tree from Pleistocene megafauna. So this tree actually has some very sought after fruit, very long fruit, almost like giant peas, which still is eaten today by a lot of coyotes, raccoons who disperse the seeds. But also in the Pleistocene about oh, 120,000 years ago. So during this time, there was the megafauna of giant ground sloths, woolly mammoths, and they would really like to eat this fruit a lot. So this tree grew with this adaptation to prevent it from uh, stopping these animals from eating it. So behind me here we have another honey locust tree, but you may be thinking there are no thorns on this tree, Sam. But did you know there is actually a thornless variety of honey locust, and it is called the Moraine honey locust. Yes, named after Moraine, Ohio. Okay, so post-World War II in 1949, um, Clarence Siebenthaler was driving home with his son, and they found, you know, the honey locust tree um, that had a low amount of thorns on it, liked it, cut a branch off, propagated themselves. Um, and then eventually they were able to propagate about 140 acres of the thornless honey locust, which became the first patented shade tree ever. Okay. It was patent number 836 in 1949. And yes, there was actually called the Plant Protection app act and what this does is you can pretty much put a patent on a tree usually for fruit trees um you know they could be sold you know within 20 years um you know the patent itself or be sold to other companies for the royalties but the shade tree the thornless honey locust was patented by the siebenthaler company in dayton ohio in 1949 and this was post world war ii where there was a lot of expansion a lot, a lot of houses being built a lot of suburbs being built and at this time too, in 1947, is when the Dutch elm disease came to Ohio from the Ohio Furniture Company. So they were looking for a tree, a shade tree to replace this, kind of a uh, sprouting fountain type tree. 
So they used the moraine honey locust because it was the thornless, fast-growing tree that they can plant, um, and it came from Dayton, Ohio. So once again, that is the moraine honey locust, all right? Well, so this is a cedar tree, and this is cedar apple rust. Yeah, look at that. After the big rain, it's starting to ooze out. You can see some of the uh, other portions of the tree are orange. And then up here, that's what it looks like beforehand. And then now that it's all ooey and gooey and stuff. But this is actually a fungus, yeah, that grows on the tree. So cedar apple rust. Ugh, gross. It's all soft and everything. Okay, well that's gonna be it for me for this week. I wanna thank everybody for watching. Again, uh, there will be a link in the bottom for tree identification in Ohio. Uh, so if you have any trees on your property that you don't, haven't been able to identify, you can use this. Um, but I hope everyone has a wonderful week and thank you for watching.